Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for today's Lunch and Learn, Stroke, What You Need to Know. My name is Kathy Chern and I am a consumer health librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by Hackensack Meridian Health and the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Our speaker today is Miriam Medina, MSN, RN, CNRN, SCRN, Stroke, Co Stroke Center Coordinator at Raritan Bay Medical Center. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Please keep your microphones muted and your webcams off. When available, the recording will be ready for viewing at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Our speaker will answer questions at the end of the talk. Please be aware that the speaker cannot provide medical advice to attendees during this program. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Marian. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Okay, so let's start this uh, uh, discussion on stroke awareness and prevention. Uh, next slide, Kathy. Okay, so when it comes to a stroke, time is brain. In case um, you might have heard that through um, some uh, media um, uh, uh, reviews and so forth. And what it basically means is stroke is a brain attack. It's, a, it, it's the brain is receiving an intense um, disruption of its blood flow and as a result, it is not functioning to the capacity that it should be functioning to. Oh, okay. Um, it, what the, the exact definition of a stroke is a sudden interruption of blood flow to a particular part of the brain. A brain attack is very serious and it eats and you need to seek a uh, medical emergency. An interruption of blood flow can result in the death of brain cells and impair body functions. And we lose several million neurons in our brain while if our brain is experiencing a stroke and you do not uh, get immediate medical attention during this. Uh, next slide. So there's some stroke statistics that some may be aware of. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in this country, but it's unfortunately the number one cause of disability in this country. Stroke is preventable. As many of us might think, how can you prevent a stroke? We're going to discuss that here in our talk. It's beatable and it's treatable. Um, the age of stroke victims under the age of 65, there's approximately 28% of our populations experience a stroke under the age of 65. This past year, 2020, during our pandemic, we unfortunately saw a big rise in stroke cases due to COVID. And those over the age of 65, there's approximately 72% of our patients uh, fall in, in this um, age bracket. The risk of stroke doubles for every decade over the age of 55. I, well, I do want to stress that stroke is not a disease for the elder population, it is a disease for all. We, I've seen stroke occur in someone in their 20s, in their 30s, and unfortunately, I'm seeing a lot of patients experiencing their first, first stroke in their 50s. The, the good news about this is with all the technology and advancement and uh, research that has been done with stroke, four million survivors are alive today, thanks to the research that has been done by the American Stroke Association. Next slide, Kathy. Now, there's two types of strokes when we discuss the term of stroke, because remember, the definition of stroke is the interruption of blood vessel of blood into our brain. So there's two types of strokes. There's an ischemic stroke, and there's also a hemorrhagic stroke. The ischemic stroke is 87% of strokes fall under this category, and the other 13 fall under the other category, which is hemorrhagic, and we'll go into that in just a minute. What's an ischemic stroke? It's called, caused by a vessel. If you see on the lower right-hand corner, it looks like a freeway. Your blood, you know, the vessels in your, in your a body are like the freeways uh, that in, in our country. Route 9, interstate, think about it like that, going up to your brain. When there's a blocked uh, road, let's say um, Route 5 in the uh, Old Bridge area, five, Route 516, there's an accident and the road gets blocked, then the traffic is not filing through 516, it gets blocked. So when that happens in the brain, depending where that blockage occurs in the brain, whether it's in the front, the, the middle, or the back, 
that area now gets disrupted of blood flow and that area of the brain is not functioning, that's when you begin to see certain signs and symptoms. That again, we'll also get into in a minute. You can also get this blockage from fatty deposits that are lining the inside of the vessel. And that lining of the vessel, those uh, deposits come from uncontrolled diabetes as well as hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol levels because all this, the, the high cholesterol needs to line somewhere in your vessels or in, in your um, um, body fat. That's where you can get some um, LDL, some cholesterol uh, coverage. And that's why the fat around your abdomen area is kind of the worst type of fat to have because all your major organs are around this center part of your body. So if you have high uh, uh, cholesterol levels and the, and, the, and the fat is being deposited in that area, you are at a very high risk of a heart attack or a stroke. And then there's thrombus. That's a clot that forms from a fat deposit or from just a clot forming in your blood vessels and it dislodges from somewhere in your body, circulates up to your heart and it can either land in your lungs or it can land up in your brain and that's where you develop the stroke. But just be mindful that these three, cons these three reasons of, of uh, the blockage is what causes the interruption of blood flow to the brain, which is a cause of the stroke. Then our other type of stroke, you can go on, Kathy, to the next one. This is a hemorrhagic stroke. And um, these strokes is, as they say, hemorrhagic is bleeding. And it's a weakened blood vessel. If you see the picture on the right-hand side, the, the aneurysm, which is a bubble, has burst it, and the blood leaks out through there, and it leaks out inside the brain. This uh, weakened blood vessel can come from an aneurysm, which is this photograph here. An aneurysm is a ballooning on the side of the vessel. This can develop uh, when you are born. You might have an aneurysm and never, ever, ever know it, or you can have some uncontrolled hypertension because think of uncontrolled hypertension as pressure, high blood pressure. So when you're blowing up a balloon and you're expanding that balloon, expanding that balloon, after you get to a certain pressure, it can burst. That is the same concept I like to describe when we talk about aneurysm with uncontrolled hypertension. There's also what's called arterial venous malformation. It's, it's somehow in, in, in vitro when the brain was developing, you did not have uh, arteries go into capillaries and then go into, excuse me, uh, uh, go into uh, the exchange and then be, go into the veins and then the blood circulate back into the heart to get cleaned again. And then there's AVM malformations, which are clusters of abnormal blood vessels. Sometimes you uh, you may come across having AV malformations do, uh, when you have frequent headaches. Frequent headaches, and sometimes they, they may diagnose you as migraines. But to feel comfortable to know if you have any AVM malformations or a cluster of these abnormal vessels that might be causing you to have headaches, is you ask your physician to run an exam. It's called uh, MRA. And it's basically a test similar to an MRI. MRI just takes pictures of the outside of the brain. MRA takes pictures of the, of the vessels itself, and from an MRA, the, um, the uh, radiologist can see if you have any bubbling of this, and then if it requires any immediate attention. Because sometimes you can live with, a, with an aneurysm and never ever have an issue. Then you have uh, other aneurysms that um, are giving you, are very symptomatic, and one of those symptoms is severe uh, frequent headaches, and you can have interventions done for this AV malformation. It's coiling or um, um, where they snip the actual aneurysm. There's a, there's a lot of um, ways of treating these aneurysms, but the way to find out if you have an aneurysm is you need to have an MRA done, and that's where the doctor can see really well the vessels that are occurring in the brain. Um, because I think one of the questions Kathy mentioned someone had, is how do you differentiate a stroke headache from, a, from another type of headache. When I, when I get to, this, to that question, a stroke headache, that means that the blood is already leaked out of the vessel and is inside the brain. I can say that the headache that you get when you're experiencing a stroke 
every person has always said it is the worst headache they have ever felt. And the reason why is because fluid is going filling up your brain cavity that is not intended to be there because the brain sits in a very tight spot of the uh, um, underneath your 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 uh, your cranium underneath your bone here your your brain sits there and there's some fluid in there because it's kind of floating if I may put it that way your brain floats there for um, movement and it's very slight movement um, but when you if you fill up that space with blood, you start to squeeze the brain, and your first reaction is to have an intense, intense, intense headache. And you, everyone always describes it who had, makes it into the emergency room because this a hemorrhagic stroke is very life-threatening. Always say, and they're holding their headache, it's the worst headache I've ever had. And even patients who suffer from migraines, can, they can even distinguish, no, they'll tell you, no, this is not one of like my migraine headaches. I don't suffer personally from headaches of any type, but I do know that uh, a hemorrhagic stroke, um, when they come in with the headache, it, every patient has always said it's the worst headache that I've ever had. So, um, and, and then, but we have, when, when someone mentions something, this, something to this effect to you, it's not, okay, let's take an aspirin or a Tylenol and go to bed. When someone tells you, I've had the worst headache I've ever had, and they have some of the risk factors that we're going to go over in just a second, call 911 or, and bring this patient immediately to the emergency room because there are interventions that can be done if someone is experiencing a hemorrhagic stroke. It's not always a fat fatality. You, you don't think of, you know, unfortunately many of them are fatal but there are a good percentage of them that are not fatal, and the key to this is arriving into the hospital in time. Okay, Kathy, the next slide. Okay, then we have what's called transient ischemic attacks, and it's short for TIAs. These are warning, um, what they like to call warning strokes that can happen before a major stroke. And I will say our body always talks to us. Unfortunately, we don't always listen to our body. Um, when you have a TIA, you have symptoms of a stroke, but they resolve within 24 hours or in less, in a minute or two minutes. Um, you might have a, a facial droop, a weakness, a slurred speech, um, a confusion, and by the time they bring you to the hospital, you're completely resolved. That's called a TIA. These are what I refer to as ticking bombs. When you experience a TIA, it is imperative that you come to the hospital to get yourself worked up to find out what is causing these TIAs. And we do exams, we do tests that's called carotid ultrasounds because we want to see the vessels that are going up here on the side of your neck that goes up to your brain. Are they getting perfused or are they narrowing because of maybe your diabetes or maybe your cholesterol? You have fat deposits there. So the blood cannot flow easily up to your brain, and when your pressure gets too high, it might close, give you these symptoms, but as soon as you relax, the vessel opens up, and blood goes up to the brain, and the symptoms go away. That's what is uh, imperative when you have these TIAs to have what they call a stroke workup, and one of those workups is when we check your carotid arteries to, see for, to check for its patencies, as it's referred to as well as checking the inside of the head, those brain vessels with an MRA, to see if you having any stenosis going on, narrowing of some vessels there, that we can go in and try and open up in the same principle that they do a cardiac cath. If there is anybody on, the, on this um, webinar has had or knows someone who's had a cardiac cath, you go up through the leg, sometimes through the arm, when you get to the heart, um, they put some dye, and the doctor can then see which vessel is it is the one that's narrowing on the on the dye, on the uh, imaging, and then he goes in and he opens it up with a stent. We have that same concept in stroke patients uh, as well when we work you up, but all, with stents and up in the brain, it all depends on where that stenosis is occurring. If it's occurring around the carotid arteries. Yes, we, they can put some stents, or you end up going through a carotid endorectomy where they cut it, they open up the vessel, and they remove the clot, and they put, um, we, we refer to it as a little umbrella to prevent any clots from dislodging while the doctor is cleaning the vessel. 
and then they have less, less evasive procedures where they go in and put the stent to open up the vessel the same way that they treat the heart. Um, as well as when with these TIAs, they look to see what other things might be causing. They look to see what your blood pressure is and what your LDL, which is the bad cholesterol in your bloodstream, to see what number that is. They look at your A1C, which is an indicator of um, diabetes, to see if it's uh, over 7.0 or under 7.0, because over 7.0 maybe 7.5, 7.8, something like that, is pre-diabetic. Anything above that, they're going to diagnose you as being a diabetic. And then if you didn't know that before, and, and then you find out when you're admitted into the hospital for this stroke workup, that would be uh, conducive of preventing the next stroke when you have these TIAs. And um, they'll see to see if there's any others, such as sickle cell anemia, if there's any history of that. So when you have these TIA, it's so critical to be admitted into the hospital because you can't really do these tests as an outpatient. Uh, it's just, it's more imperative that you're in the hospital. They run all these tests within two days or so, and then it helps us, the, the neurologist or your primary attending, to determine what is causing these TIAs because you want to get to the bottom of what's causing the TIA because when you can resolve what's causing it, you can prevent the stroke. So that's why I said at the beginning that 80% of strokes are preventable for this reason. Once you find out what caused it or is causing it and you, and you begin to treat it, you've just now prevented a stroke from occurring. And our number one culprit, you can go on to the next slide, Kathy. Guys, right, so I, so I say it's preventable, beatable, and treatable, and TIA is that mini stroke and it's a warning sign uh, for us not to um, blow it off, if I may say that, or, or, or disbelief it, because when you have these symptoms, it's because you have a precursor happening, and if you ignore it, um, it, it can potentially give you a full-blown stroke. And when it comes, as we mentioned at the beginning of the program, when it comes to a stroke, time is of extreme essence especially when we start to talk in a bit about how we treat strokes. Um, next slide, Kathy. Okay, so we talk about the risk factors for stroke. And these are, um, the first four are the most common cause for stroke, which is hypertension, high cholesterol or hyperlipidemia, as we refer to, smoking, diabetics, very little exercise, because unfortunately very little exercise can bring up the, uh, the top four uh, risk factors for stroke, as well as for age. Unfortunately, as we get older, we may develop some type of disease, um, heart disease or some kind of pulmonary disease or stuff like that. So age is not always working to our, our favor. But when we speak about um, risk factors and high blood pressure, the reason why high blood pressure, what, or I should explain why, what, how does high blood pressure cause a stroke? is when the pressure is high in the vessel, again, think of it as a balloon, or think of it as pressure getting going through a door. There's only but so much. Um, if five people want to walk through a single door, a 36-inch door, five people, yeah, you're going to probably go a little bit single file, maybe two at a time. But when there's so much pressure, there's 15 people trying to get through that one door, it's just not going to happen. Um, and you have... The, the vessel ends up constricting, getting smaller, allowing less blood to circulate through that passage. You get the blockage, remember, so now there's no blood flow, and then, boom, that's where you can get, develop your stroke. So that's why high blood pressure is very, very important. It is the number one risk factor for um, stroke, as well as for a heart attack. High cholesterol, this is the second, and if you have both high blood pressure and high cholesterol, you're at an even higher risk because remember, the high cholesterol, if you're not addressing your cholesterol medication by taking some kind of a statin medication, which is a medication to reduce your LDLs in your bloodstream, and you, you, you don't address them and you don't follow your diet, that fat of the LDL is going to be, is going to line itself within the artery. So if you have, again, a doorway that's 36 inches wide, if you have a lot of cholesterol or if you have too many things blocking that pathway, um, 
the it, it, it has the higher probability of just collapsing the vessel because it's blocked, not allowing any blood. Then you have your high blood pressure behind you trying to push it, push the blood through. And with this type of combination, you definitely can get a stroke and you can get a hemorrhagic stroke from that because the block, the, 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 the lumen, the vessel is small. You have blood pressure pushing it. And like a balloon, you can only take but so much pressure before it ends up bursting. Smoking and diabetes, it's just the remnants of too much uh, uh, glucose in your bloodstream. It, again, it also lines the vessel of your um, uh, artery, and any of those little crystal sugars gets dislodged, circulates through your bloodstream, gets through a small vessel that it can't pass through, boom, there's the blockage, then there's no blood flow, Hence, that's where you get your stroke. Smoking, it's the same thing as those residuals that you're inhaling um, getting through your bloodstream, through your pulmonary system, when you, because your pulmonary system cleanses your, your, uh, your uh, blood. So once you're inhaling, all those vapors are getting inside your bloodstream to that extent, and the body cannot metabolize those items. So eventually they find a way is around the vessels. Very little exercise because... With very little exercises, we develop, you unfortunately may, not all, um, develop um, um, obesity. And obesity brings you diabetes. And not in all circumstances, it brings you diabetes, and it can give you hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, and it can give you hypertension. And as I mentioned, age, unfortunately, the older we get, we are at risk of developing either a heart attack or a stroke. Next slide, Kathy. Okay, now we talk about risk modifications. When we mentioned at the beginning where we say stroke is preventable, it's preventable because those risk factors that I just mentioned to you, um, hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and smoking, you can modify. That's why they're, they're called risk modifications. That are some of your the, um, things that you can do to prevent it. So blood, with blood pressure and cholesterol, get yourself checked at your um, primary doctor. Uh, or whenever you see at event, not unfortunately now with the pandemic that's going on, but hopefully soon when there's um, um, blood pressure, health drives, healthcare drives um, it, around the community and someone's taking blood pressures, uh, you know, take your blood pressure um, and, and see what that number is. We like to see it around the 120s systolic, which is that top number, and the bottom number in the 80s. If you get a 136, 138 over 90, it's prehypertension, and basically, like I mentioned before, it's your body talking to you. We just have to listen. It's saying, my pressure's starting to get a little bit high. Let's look at our diet, and the number one culprit to our diet that brings our blood pressure up is salt. And you'd be amazed how when you cut back on your salt, you will see a 10%, a 10 millimeters of mercury drop in your uh, uh, blood pressure number. So you're in the 140s, 150s, and you're not on any blood pressure medication. If you cut down on your salt, and you need to just take a really good look at what you're eating, and be mindful that food that you eat a lot in cans, they contain a lot, a lot of salt. Uh, because they're, they're, they want to make them a long, give them a long shelf life in the supermarket. Um, so that way your natural uh, fruits and vegetables or your frozen veggies are, are excellent because they don't contain preservatives, only canned items. Those are healthier for you than the canned items. Um, however, if you do use canned items, uh, such as for, let's say, for garbanzo beans and stuff like that, you drain them. You minimize the amount of sugar that's already in the can. That would help you continue to wash the beans uh, from the can. I, obviously, you can't do that with, it, with soup if you're having a Progresso uh, can of soup. But uh, be mindful with that. Drink lots of water to wash out the salt from your system. Um, you'll also know if you're retaining too much uh, fluids from salt. Um, you, you tend to be a little bit edematous. And that's, that word edematous is mean when you have some swelling in your hands or your legs. And the way you test if it's a significant amount, and I hope you can see here on the thing, is you squeeze your wrist. And then you look for some red markings here. They should go away in about two, three seconds. But when you squeeze your hand, I'm trying to squeeze it really tight, and you see those red marks for longer than five seconds, 
that usually says that you are retaining a little bit of fluid. A quick way to um, pull fluid out of your body is drinking actually lemon. Lemon water is a natural diuretic. So if you suffer from high blood pressure and you need to reduce um, some fluids that you have, I highly recommend a glass of water with some lemon in it and you'll see yourself naturally go to the bathroom and start removing fluids, unnecessary fluids from your body and you'll see that your swelling goes down very quickly. When it comes to cholesterol and controlling that, that's mainly all diet modified, watching foods that are high in um, cholesterol and, um, and taking medication. If you currently are uh, diagnosed with hypertension or, or hyperlipidemia, please um, take your medication. Um, blood pressure, if you, when you're recently diagnosed with high blood pressure and they put you on some medication, sometimes you feel like tired because your body, remember, with the high blood pressure, your heart is working on overdrive to pump all the blood in your bloodstream. If it's constantly working and then we give you a medication to relax your muscles so it doesn't have to pump so hard, one of the first side effects that you're going to get from this medication is that you're going to feel a little bit tired and then, unfortunately, some people, oh, no, it's making me tired, so I'm not going to take it anymore. Please express those concerns to your primary doctor so that way they can explain to you and just keep you on the medication for a little while while your body adjusts to it. Or if you're having other side effects from the blood pressure, there's many, many different types of blood pressure medications that they can put you on. But once you are diagnosed with high blood pressure, and this is another thing that we see a lot in the emergency room, unfortunately, is you take the medication, you start to feel great. You're not feeling that tiredness because the, the, the heart was pumping so hard and um, you're not getting those headaches because sometimes um, high blood pressure, one of the symptoms is, um, hypertent is um, excuse me, headaches. And then they feel that they're okay and they stop taking their medications. And unfortunately, those are the ones that we end up seeing in the emergency room with a stroke. Uh, cholesterol, it's the same thing. You should frequently have your, you have a lipid panel. That's what it's referred to where they check your total cholesterol, your HDL, which is your healthy cholesterol, your LDL, the bad cholesterol, and your triglycerides at least yearly during your annual checkup to make sure that if you're taking cholesterol medication, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing by that LDL number having to come down? We like to see an LDL under 75 um, millimeters of LDL, uh, LDL, excuse me, less than 75. If it's above that and you're taking cholesterol medication, then I don't think you're taking the right amount of milligrams if your cholesterol level is still high. But then you also have to ask yourself and be truthful to yourself, I'm on cholesterol medication. That doesn't mean I, get, I should still be able to eat everything that I was eating before. We have to modify our diet when we're taking blood pressure medication and cholesterol medication because if not, it's just a fighting battle that, unfortunately, you end, up, you end up going to lose by developing a stroke or a heart attack if you take blood pressure medication and you're still taking, you're eating with a lot of salt still in your diet. Um, not to smoke, I know that is a uh, easier thing to say than to do, but I know that there are um, many um, there's medications that can help you stop smoking if you're a smoker. And I know that they put things in cigarettes that have made it very addictive and difficult to stop uh, smoking. But there are also areas out, and I know in Hackensack and Meridian Health, we do have a, a, help, a, a program where uh, you can get involved with that helps you to stop smoking. Uh, another thing when it comes here to uh, smoking is vaping. Vaping is a very um, uh, dangerous uh, form of inhaling what I call toxins. Um, we saw with um, some COVID patients that came in that were very young, we were kind of taken aside a, a, a why they were having such issues with their lungs when they came with COVID at a young age. And in several cases, when you're, we're, we're finding out about the patient's history, we find out that they were vaping. And uh, vaping is it's just going to... Uh, ruin your lungs, and again, what you inhale here through your nose eventually gets into your circulatory system. Controlling your diabetes, uh, we need to annually be checking your A1C. The, uh, anything above 7.0 is considered high, uh, is considered diabetic, excuse me, less than 7.0 is considered non-diabetic. 
If you are currently on diabetic medications, you should be checking your blood sugar frequently to see that the uh, medications that you're taking is controlling your levels of, ins of um, sugar in your body throughout the day. Uh, one thing that is not good for diabetics is skipping meals because that you cause a lot of uh, uh, roller coasters on your diabetic numbers, on your blood sugar numbers. Try and eat every three hours very small meals and focusing on uh, proteins and, and vegetables and being very mindful of the carbs that you're having um, and meals. We have an excellent um, uh, diabetic center here in our Old Bridge Hospital, HMH in Old Bridge, um, and we have two great um, um, di uh, diabetic doctors there. And right now, I'm just drawing a blank to uh, um, her name right now. But we have an excellent um, uh, center there. And your diet, being mindful of low salt and low fat, daily exercise, 20 minutes a day of walking outside and getting some good fresh air is healthy. If you see, if, you, if you're in an area where there's lots of hills, you know, include the hills in your walk because that hill is going to, uh, what do you call it, um, have your heart pump a little more and that's the exercise that it's getting. Because remember, the heart is a muscle. And muscles, if we don't use it, we lose it. Um, that's kind of the best way that I can explain it. Um, it's the same as if anybody in this group has ever broken an arm or a leg and you were in a cast, and obviously you couldn't do any exercise to, let's say, for example, the arm, and when they take the cast off and you look at it, it's like so skinny, and comparing it to your other arm, well, that's called atrophy, and that's developed because you weren't able to exercise it. So it's the same thing with the heart. If you don't exercise it, it's laid back, gets lazy, boom, you get you become obese, the obesity deals, brings on diabetic, diabetes, the diabetes can bring on hyperten hyperlipidemia, hyperlipidemia can then bring on hypertension. So you see how it's a roller coaster effect. And alcohol in um, moderation, um, that's kind of all I can say about that. For me, alcohol is a uh, sleeping aid for me. I take one, one glass of wine and I'm sleeping. <laughs> so I'm not much of an expert when it comes to this here. Next slide, Kathy. Also, would you know how to recognize a stroke, anyone in this room? If not, I think the biggest takeaway from this talk is the next slide. It's be fast. And this is how the public can improve the recovery and recognition of someone surviving a stroke. And be fast stands for B for balance. And it's a loss of balance and, and what's What's unique about the be fast? It's sudden. You're fine, and all of a sudden, you lose your balance. And it's not like you tripped, or uh, you're walking on the sidewalk, and there was a pebble, and you tripped on it, and you lost your balance. I'm not referring to that. I'm talking about where you're where you're walking, and all of a sudden, you lose your balance, and you're walking towards one side of the room because you need the wall to hold you up. Or you're saying, "Wow, my, this room is starting to spin all of a sudden." And with that spitting, then you get a headache. Okay, our next symptom is E, eyes. All of a sudden, you lose your visual, your vision. It goes and comes, or you suddenly can't see peripherally onto the side, or you feel like it's a shade where, you know, when you close a shade, it goes down and then it comes back up, and you can't explain why that is happening. These two symptoms, the B and the E, the balance and the eyes, your stroke is occurring in the back of the brain around the um, cerebellum region as well as your um, um, occipital area back here in the brain because that's where balance and eye movement is controlled in the brain. Uh, now, F, F is for fast, and I mean, I'm sorry, F is for face, and one side of the face is drooping. And that's why I say that recognizing it, the person who's actually experiencing a stroke might not know they're having one for this simple reason. You can't see your face unless you look in the mirror. And if you look in the mirror, suddenly, like, one side of your face is down like here. And when you smile, this cheek is up, but this cheek seems flat. And then your nostril looks like it's collapsing. And if you open your eyes, this eye would be drooping. Now, what side is 
uh, being affected, it all depends on what side the stroke is affecting. But when it comes to the face, if one side is drooping versus the other side, that's an indication that the patient is having a stroke. A, arms or legs weak or weakness. And basically, if you see the face is starting to droop, like it doesn't look, this your face doesn't really look like this, you know, for a spouse, like, honey, something's not right with your face. Ask them to raise both their hands up. If one is coming up and the other one is staying down or one comes up and the other one is just keeps falling and they're trying with a lot of effort to bring up the other arm, it's the same with the legs. Then we go to S, and you ask them to say a simple, se a simple sentence, such as the sky is blue. The sky is blue. Mm. You have any of these five symptoms, and they are sudden. Where they weren't there before, and all of a sudden they're there now. Then, oh, we remove the slide. Kathy. Well, I'll keep going. Okay, and then T is it's, it's time to call 911. And what's important when you call 911 is to, uh, they are going to ask you what, what is your emergency. You explain to them, I think my spouse, my daughter, my son, whomever, is experiencing a stroke because, and then offer one of the reasons, they, their arms, or they're talking funny. And what's very, very important to uh, offer the uh, 911 uh, operator is, when did it happen? Because your last well-known time is very critical to determining what treatment you're going to get. Because we, we treat me, uh, strokes when they come into the emergency room with a medication called Alcaplace, and it's short for AT, uh, TPA. This medication um, dissolves the clot that's occurring into the brain. The thing is that we can only give that medication within a four and a half hour window. So that's why uh, the operator, or when you get into the hospital, one of the questions that they will ask you is either the nurse or the ED uh, provider is, when did you notice these symptoms? And if, if you say, oh, okay, it was just before we were having lunch at 12 o'clock, okay, the last one known night is 12 o'clock. We have four and a half hours to make a determination whether we're going to give TPA. We want to give this TPA within the first hour of them presenting into the emergency room. Um, next slide, Kathy. Yeah, sorry about that. I got disconnected. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, then there's some other subtle stroke symptoms um, uh, that can occur as well. And sometimes these fall into small um, strokes. We usually don't pick them up. We'll wait almost a day or two days after having some of these symptoms. And sure enough, when you go in and they do the MRI, they come telling you that, yes, you've had a, you've had a, um, a stroke. Confusion, where you're unable to understand what is happening and you can't think clearly or feel, you, you feel thrown off. Again, these are sudden symptoms. And what's difficult about this symptom is if you have a loved one in, in the family who's suffering from dementia or Alzheimer, how do you differentiate if it's the Alzheimer's or the dementia versus a confusion from a stroke, I can give you the, a clear-cut answer to that. I can just say I personally have my mom who's suffering from Alzheimer's, and I always, when she's getting confused, I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, is this, she's 88 years old, I'm like, is she developing a stroke or is this from the Alzheimer's? So I'll be quite honest, I do be fast. I look at her balance, okay, mom, can you see me with the eyes? I walk around the room, she sees me, she's following fast, I ask her to smile, let me see all your teeth, she's symmetrical, what we call A, bring both your arms up, mom, they're both arms, and she's speaking clearly, but just that slight confusion, then I attribute it to the Alzheimer's. If I found any of those B fast, the B, the E, the F, the A, the S positive, then I would be calling 911 and having my mom brought to the hospital. The other one is difficult understanding. Again, this is the same thing as the dementia and Alzheimer's, unable to comprehend speech or language. Some patients, our elder patients that um, uh, have the dementia and the Alzheimer's cannot always understand speech and language. So it, it, it's critical for the person who lives with the, in, with the individual to come to the hospital with them because the emergency room doctor is going to ask you, is this the, the patient's normal? confusion because they have the history of the Alzheimer's or dementia is this is their difficulty in understanding language and you as a primary care provider it is critical for you to share whether yes or not or be honest on you know and say I'm not quite sure 
we would, they would activate a code stroke when you get into the emergency room and work them up. Um, dizziness, feeling faint, lightheaded, loss of balance, as we mentioned before, and numbness. This gets sometimes uh, mislooked with diabetes because when you have very bad diabetes, you have what's called neuropathy, and that's where you have some sometimes tingling and numbness to your peripheral parts of your body, meaning your hands and your feet from uncontrolled diabetes. So when you have that weakness to the arm and it's accompanied with numbness, sometimes it's just the motor part that gives it away that it's a stroke and not necessarily the numbness in your uh, fingers because of the diabetes. That's if you have diabetes. Um, but those are other signs and symptoms to look for if you suspect that the person is having a stroke. And you know what? I personally say if you think, if it's slightly in your head, maybe this is a stroke, call 911, come to the emergency room, and let a trained professional tell you, yes, it's a stroke, or no, it's not a stroke. Because you don't want to have any regrets afterwards and, and, and feel guilty that if I would have brought my loved one earlier to the hospital, they could have been able to have done something to uh, have helped them with the stroke so their, their disabilities wouldn't be so overwhelming. Um, so I, I always say that just bring them to the hospital and have a trained professional look, look at them, especially, like, you know, I think one of the questions that Kathy was mentioning is how do you, how do you differentiate between a kind of regular headache to a, uh, a hemorrhagic headache? Definitely a hemorrhagic headache. They are holding their heads down, and they say it is the worst headache I've ever had. That is a telltale sign of a hemorrhagic stroke. When you're just having, oh, I just have this frequent headache and it's bothering me, it bothers me with light, um, my sinuses aggravate and stuff like that. It could be migraines or it can just be a simple headache. But I don't want people on this um, call to think to blow off headaches because headaches are not normal, okay? If you do have frequent headaches, have it checked out, and they do have neurologists who are specialists in headaches, okay? Next slide. Okay. Um, so these are, as we mentioned before, some ways of um, preventing a stroke, which is exercise, low sodium, as we mentioned. If you have circulatory problems, work with your health care professional to improve your circulation, and sometimes very good physical therapy would work with this. Uh, if you experience a stroke, please, please call 911 immediately. Um, don't say, oh, it's going to blow over, it's going to blow over, because um, I sometimes say it will blow over and you'll be six feet under. Okay, every minute matters when it comes to the brain because, not because my world is neurology, but the brain is the most important organ because without this, nothing from the neck down works. Next slide. Um, people sometimes don't respond to the symptoms that we just mentioned for some of the following reasons. They don't recognize the symptoms, but now everybody on this call is going to recognize the symptoms. Denial or fear. We can't always let fear outweigh our, our, the education that we've gained, okay? Um, think nothing can be done that is so far uh, off the radar because there are many, many um, interventions that can be done with stroke, and the main thing is preventing it. Knowing what your risk factors is is the number one way that we do things to prevent strokes. You worry about the cost. Yes, healthcare is very expensive, but um, I think your loved ones would prefer to have you with them than not with them, and that's kind of, you know, all I can really say when it comes to cost. Um, don't let that get into your way of leading a, some, a, a healthful um, life. Um, think symptoms will go away, unfortunately, when there's an accident on the parkway, unless you got a tow truck to remove the accident, traffic won't flow. These symptoms, if there's a blockage, which is the definition of a stroke in the brain and it's not removed and blood doesn't circulate through, it's not going to go away. And uh, fear or don't trust hospitals. Uh, our organization, uh, I'm very proud. I've been working for Hackensack Meridian for 25 years now and I've been a nurse for about 27 years. Um, not trusting hospitals. Nurses and doctors do not um, go to school for many years and go into this profession to hurt the public. Um, do accidents happen? Yes, accidents can happen, but it's never, ever with the intent to hurt someone. Um, so not trusting hospitals sometimes 
if a loved one dies at a hospital, we, we need to be angry with something, so we're angry at the hospital. Um, and, and there are, I'm sure, circumstances that, you know, you, you can feel you might not trust the hospital, you know, or, or the doctors, but don't allow that to get into your way if you suspect someone is having a stroke because the consequences from not addressing a stroke is just it's detrimental. Because remember, it's the fifth leading cause of death in this country, so there's four others that are worse than ours, but it's the number one cause of disability. And that's what we want to stress. It's the number one cause of disability where you felt independent, now you've had a stroke. Now you're not independent anymore. And that, in a, from a psychological perspective, is very difficult when you develop a stroke in your 40s or 50s because this is not an expectation that you are going to become disabled in your 40s or 50s. You expect that, you know, when you get much older, that you're fragile and, and things like that, but not in your 40s and 50s. And this can be a huge psychological impact for someone um, uh, of a young age and who's still working, contributing to society in, in many ways. And not to say that if you're you only contribute to societies if you work. That's not what I'm saying. But um, be uh, mindful of, of, of understanding strokes, that it's preventable by understanding your risk factors, dealing with those risk factors, and controlling them, the hypertension, diabetes, um, and hyperlipidemia, because that in itself, 80% of you preventing a stroke comes right from there. And if you do have any of those diseases, and you go to the doctor and they prescribe medication, stick to your medication and exercise. Next slide. You know, uh, some treatments, as we mentioned before, the ischemic stroke, there's medications and their devices. Um, on this call, as anybody I'm sure has experienced a clogged um, plumbing issue with hairs going down the sink, what do you take out well, after you give Drano? We like to look at it as medication, the alteplase, the TPA to dissolve the clot is the Drano. It tries to dissolve it. But if the clot is very big, the Drano or the TPA can't quite clean it. So you got to kind of go in with what we call a mechanical retrieval. And what I try to tell the layperson is, what do you pull out when your plumbing can't get cleaned out with the Drano? You pull out the sneak. You put it through your pipes, and then you roll it, and, then tr and you start seeing all that uh, hair coming out and, and, and gook and stuff coming out from the pipe. We have the same, a similar concept not that brutal, because the brain is very delicate. We go in with a mechanical under fluoroscopy, and when you see the clot, you, uh, you remove it. Certain, you know, there's a process. You can look it up. It's called mechanical retrieval. And then you remove the clot from there. Um, there's, again, before they get to that stage, they do some diagnostic tests to see if it's safe for the surgeon to go in to pull that clot out. Because if it's too far into the brain, the surgeon is not going to take a risk to put through that instrument deep into your brain and cause bleeding into your brain because then that makes your stroke worse. So there's tests before they do this, but first is medication out to place. We can give you TPA the first four and a half hours. That's why time is brain, and you'll hear it all over the month of May, time is brain, because after that then we can give you this medication. Under 24 hours, if you have a large clot in the brain, then we can use a device which is called a mechanical retrieval. Hemorrhagic strokes, I think uh, it speaks for itself. A hemorrhagic stroke treated, we have to go in and surgically remove it. But not on all cases because sometimes that cl the, the vessel can spontaneously heal itself and the surgeon doesn't have to go in. But if there's a significant burst of a vessel, yes, a surgeon will have to go in to try and fix it. And it all depends on how the vessel broke burst or what exactly is causing the bleeding for the surgeon to determine how is his plan to go in to fix it. Next slide. So stroke recovery, 10% 10, 10 of stroke survivors recover almost completely from a stroke. At 25% recover with minor impairments, 40% do experience moderate to severe impairment requiring special care, meaning uh, rehab centers. 10% require care with either skilled care, a long-term facility, and unfortunately, 15% die shortly after the stroke. And death from a stroke all depends on the location of the stroke. Next slide. Types of rehab. You, I'm sure many have heard physical therapy. It is amazing what physical therapy can do for the stroke survivor. You go in there and you can't move your right arm and there's 
techniques and, and things that they do, and you have to stick with it because if you're doing it as an outpatient, just don't do the therapy when you're in the therapist's office. You follow those therapies as well outside at home and consistent because what you're trying to do is wake up some of the sleepy cells in your brain to compensate for those that die because of the stroke. Then you have occupational therapy. That's basically learning how to take care of yourself and um, being safe while you're like, perhaps, let's say, taking a shower. If you, if you had a stroke and it affected your right arm and you use soap, you know, okay, so how do I bathe myself now if I can't use my right arm um, anymore? And I can give you uh, this that I learned um, from physical therapy is if you use a soap to wash yourself, and it doesn't necessarily have to be from someone who's had a stroke, you can take a bar of stroke, uh, I'm sorry, a bar of soap, Drill a hole through it, put a string through it, put it around your neck. Now you have the soap hanging down here, and you take your towel or your hand, and you use your good hand, lather it up, and now you're able to um, lather yourself and clean yourself, run yourself over water. And when you're done, you take the bar of soap with the string, and then you hang it on the faucet that's coming off the... Oh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank. Well, that thing. Yeah, you, you know, you put it there... This is what I hate about Zoom because nobody can ever help me with the missing words that I'm missing. And you put your, you know, the, the there or on your dials, hot and cold water dials. But this is what occupational therapy does. It teaches you other alternative ways to taking care of yourself that you might have not thought of. And you really didn't, you wouldn't have thought of thinking of these things because you weren't incapacitated at the time. Speech language therapy, that's communication skills, learning how to swallow, Sometimes you're going to be, if you, if you can't speak at all, you're going to be drawing with um, pictures or with, um, if you're able to still use your hands, typing to communicate. And then there's recreational therapy of cooking, gardening, and music is very therapeutic for a stroke, excuse me, for a stroke rehab. Next slide. Lifestyle changes for survivors and caregivers. Um, it, it's very difficult uh, when you survive a stroke. It's not like you survive a, a heart attack. Um, I always say if you're walking in the mall, and I know no, none of us have walked in the mall for quite some time, but walking out in the community, when you see someone whose arm might be in a sling or a facial droop and they're kind of limping, you might think, oh, well, this person has had a stroke. Sometimes that person who's had a stroke is um, embarrassed to go out into public because people stare at them. It's not like when you have a heart attack, you go in, they open up the stent and you're fine. You walk around the neighborhood, no one would ever know that you had a heart attack, okay? But a stroke, it, there's lasting visual um, cues, and that can deal, that can develop a lot of depression and anger towards the patient. And this would be kind of a whole separate uh, webinar. Uh, Kathy, if you ever want to go on this, is um, the aftermath of a stroke and dealing with the complications for the caregivers having to understand caring for someone for a lot of their base, for many of their basic needs, uh, pain, sexuality, intimacy, their diet, um, behavior, you know, why are they getting angry? And as the caregiver, I'm always being yelled at by my husband. If, if the husband was the one who experienced a stroke, why is he always yelling at me? And we have to understand that it's because of the stroke. And it's very difficult as the caregiver to understand um, that it's because of the stroke when who you are seeing in front of you is your loved one and uh, you just get angry because um, they're treating you this way and you feel like I should not be treated this way or I'm here taking care of you, um, the stroke survivor person might not know that and not understand it. So it's very important for survivors to go through support groups. And HMH, I can speak of the Hackensack at JFK, has an excellent support system, and I'm sure we can provide you. I, I believe it's the first Tuesday or second Tuesday of the month. Right now they're doing it virtual like we're doing this here, but it is enormously helpful to go through a support group uh, when you first get diagnosed or as the caregiver because once you are educated with what to expect when it happens, it doesn't take you back that far because you'll remember they said that this would happen. They said that this would happen. This is how I deal with it. Uh, next slide, Kat. Okay, so type of recovery services, rehab, you know, in the hospitals, they have outpatient rehab. They also have homebound therapy rehabs, um, long-term care facilities. Those are for patients, as we mentioned before, that have had very large 
um, strokes and community-based support groups. I can't stress enough how much support groups are helpful, and it's not just for stroke, for MIs, for breast cancer survivor, uh, any type of cancer survivors, because it's so easy, or it's not easy, it's more comforting to relate to someone who's already gone down your path to the path that you are about to follow, because uh, what is it, um, ignorance is bliss? When you don't know what's coming, it, it catches you off guard and you're always tense. When you know what to expect, your anxiety level comes down and then you have a more a heightened uh, awareness of how to treat what's going on. Um, next slide. I think this might be the last. Okay. So, again, May is National Stroke Awareness Month. Uh, we encourage you to spread awareness uh, throughout your friends and family. Advocate, educate, and participate. Um, educate, understand, I, I can't stress more, this be fast. Balance, eyes, face, arms, speech, and if any of these are positive, time to call 911 and let the operator know when is the last well-known time. When did this occur? Get involved and make dif a difference in the world. You know, your risk factors, I can't stress that enough. That's 80% of the battle. And in school, when you got an 80, you did pretty good, you know. So um, being mindful of those risk factors, try and prevent them. And if you do have any of them, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, stay on your medication regimen. Don't stop taking your, your medication because you don't feel right. You know, discuss, have these discussions with your attending physician. I think that brings us to a, oh, okay, be smart, reduce, recognize, and respond. Know your risk factors, stroke symptoms, and at the first sign, again, call 911 immediately. Thank you. Any questions, Kathy? Anybody typed in anything? Okay, so if you have any questions, you could type them into the chat box now. Um, let me just see. Oh, there was that question that was emailed earlier that was, uh -huh. is there a way to d differentiate between a heavy headache and a stroke headache? Actually, I think you covered that, so... Yes, the, the main thing, the main takeaway from that question is that the hemorrhagic headache, the patient says, hold their head and they say, this is the worst headache I've ever had. And sure enough, when you take their blood pressure, you're going to see a very high number, 180s, 190s. Don't let it shock you if you see 200. And that is imperative to get into the hospital. All right, so it looks like we don't have any questions. Um, so I just want to say thank you, Marian, for taking the time to present on this topic and for answering the er earlier questions. Oh, you're and, welcome. Thank you. And then um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's talk. And take care and stay safe. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.